Good morning. Uh, my name is Andrea Eshelman. I am the Deputy Executive Director at the Hawaii State Teachers uh, Association. More importantly, I'm a proud public school graduate and an advocate for teachers in our community, but also our kids. Uh, and so I'm going to be sharing with you some, some basics of what the Commission asked me to sort of outline with you folks as to what are the things we look at related to the teacher's contract. Um, my understanding is we're going to do questions at the very, very end after my colleagues from UPW and um, HGA come up. Uh, I've already had people ask me questions about coronavirus and I've already had people ask me questions about differentials. I'll be more than happy to have that dialogue at the very end, but I don't want to take away from um, my colleagues' time as well. So without further ado, um, Hawaii State Teachers Association is uh, a public uh, employees union in the state. We have about 13,500 members throughout the state, and these are teachers who teach in preschool through 12th grade. We do not represent higher ed, um, and we do not represent private schools, but we do represent all bargaining unit five, which are teachers in the charter schools and the DOE um, schools. This is a structure that as a, um, a person working with charter schools, I know we might have governing board folks in the room, or directors, or HR types, or maybe school secretaries and SASAs that you're probably um, going to get familiar with. So at the school level, we have our represent representatives. In other unions, they might call them shop stewards. In our union, we call them faculty reps. And the ratio is 1 to 10. And so in our contract, it actually says for every 10 teachers, you get one faculty rep. We also have what's called an association policy committee, which includes the grievance rep. These individuals are elected by their fellow Bargaining Unit 5 members at the school level to represent them with you on issues. These typically are also the people who are on the bargaining team if there is the need to bargain a supplemental agreement. These folks work with our HSTA Uniserve Director, which is the professional staff person that works for the association and supports schools throughout the state. We have 14 Uniserves that are on staff at HSTA on every island except for Lanai and Molokai. Um, and sometimes they might be covering across different islands, so they will definitely fly if needed to um, do work with very various schools. And so these are the folks that are working with you at the school level if there are issues, concerns, potential grievances, things like that. The teachers at the school level are trained up. They're given guidance from our staff. And if necessary, the staff will come in and, and assist them. Um, and if necessary, it actually sometimes gets escalated to, to me at the state level. But those are the folks at the school level that will be working with you. To give you some faces to the people you would be particularly working with, in Central District, we have Janine Suchia and Ray Camacho. So that we are somewhat geographically um, aligned with the DOE, but not 100%. But for Central schools, the schools that are list located in Central um, School District geographically for the DOE, those are the two staff that work with the schools. In Honolulu, we have Amber and Terry Lau. On the Leeward side, we have Jonathan and Justin, so Jonathan Leibowitz and Justin Jansen. And then on the Windward side, we have Beverly Ikalani. So those are our staff on Oahu. On the neighbor islands, uh, servicing Maui, Molokai, and Kauai, we have Christopher Chang. And servicing Maui, Lanai, and Kauai, we have Eric. They actually have divided Maui and Kauai down the middle. This is a fairly new division. We're trying some different things with our staffing. And so they're working with teachers on those, those islands. On the west side of Big Island, Kahala, Kona, and what we call Hamakua chapter, so Honoka'a schools, um, we have Maya Doherty. And then on the Hilo side, we have Rei Yamanaka. Most, the, these two ladies have a large bulk. As you probably know, we have a lot of schools on the Big Island. Okay. Um, we have re restructured our staff in recent years. So we have three of our 14 Uniserves uh, specialized in contract enforcement. So if you have an employee who you have to place under investigation, these are the people that are going to work with them regardless of where they're at in the state. If you have, um, if you have a grievance that's filed against you, these are the people that are going to be working with you as it relates to that grievance. And that's David Forrest. He takes care of uh, half of Oahu, Maui, and Lanai. Jody takes care of the other half of Oahu. And then Tom takes care of Kauai, Molokai, and the Big Island. Okay. 
So as I indicated earlier, we are the exclusive agent for teachers in bargaining unit five. Um, our school level leaders are the representatives on each campus and we do represent teachers regardless of their membership status. You may or may not be familiar with the concept of membership. So every um, teacher who's a member of the bargaining unit, so an employee within the bargaining unit, will have that opportunity to join HSTA. Regardless of their membership status, we have a legal obligation to represent them. I'm proud to say that over 97% of the teachers across, across the state do join HSTA. And so we have a very strong membership number. Um, and we will go back to those people if they haven't taken that opportunity and we will ask them again. But it doesn't matter their status. You can't just sort of say, oh, well, you're not a member of HSTA, so you don't get representation. They absolutely have that right. Um, you do need to know that because they have the right to union representation, they have what are called wine garden rights. Big picture, if we're engaging in bargaining, if you are looking at some sort of disciplinary action, those types of things, um, any sort of HR action, potentially we're going to get involved or those teachers have the right to have us in the room for that discussion. Okay, uh, so I'm going to go over some of the state laws related to collective bargaining and public employment. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about who the negotiations group is as it relates to the employer, which is a little bit different than my colleagues in the room, um, so specific to teachers. We'll talk a little bit about supplemental agreements and then I'll talk about um, payroll deductions. So these are all different things related to what the state law says and my colleagues may have other things to add when they come up. So uh, chapter 89 is our collective bargaining law in the state. So all public employees uh, are members of various bargaining units. In particular, teachers are members of what is called unit five. Uh, and so that, re that, that would be your public school teachers, right? If they're an educational assistant, that's not, our, that's not our unit. If they are a cafeteria type worker, that's not our unit. We are purely just um, classroom teacher types. Within that though, we have people who are required to be licensed, but are maybe not in the classroom, non-classroom teachers. So we represent librarians, counselors, registrars, curriculum coaches, those types of professionals are in our bargaining unit. So there may be a time that we will come to you and say, you have inappropriately labeled this person. This person should be in our unit. If they are working half time or more and they are serving in a, in a teaching capacity, they are generally our unit member, okay? Um, the other piece that you should be aware of, and this is related to bargaining, is that at the state level, we bargain what is called a master contract, <coughs> right? So for, for us, we have this big, thick one, it's about 150 pages, and then um, a year ago we negotiated supplemental pay, so this is a, just a supplement to this, this document. Uh, and so we sit down with the state of Hawaii, the Board of Education, and um, the superintendent, and we bargain. And for our units, and you'll notice different units are different, our, my colleagues will speak to that I'm sure, uh, we have across the table from us three votes from the governor, <laughs> The Board of Education has two votes, and then the superintendent has one vote. So there's six votes in that room. So I'll take a, a little bit of a pause just to acknowledge. In the charter world, there are people who don't like this. There are people who will tell me, we don't have a voice at the table from the employer group. I can totally acknowledge that. I don't control that. This is defined by state law. If the employer wants to bring charters to the table on their side, they're welcome to do that. I will tell you that we make an effort to bring charters to the table on our side. We have pe charter teachers who are on our various committees. They are involved in the work that we do to gather information about bargaining and to prepare for it. We've had charter teachers on our board of directors. We have a charter teacher who's currently our chair for our, our um, government relations committee. So um, we make sure that that voice is in the room. It's a very small amount of teachers compared to 13,500, only about 700 statewide. Our, our, our charters, but we make that effort. Um, I can't fix that on the employer side. That is a, the kuleana of the other side. They are more than welcome to bring that voice into the room, but this is what the law requires. And so this is who we go to the table with. Okay. Um, you should be aware that these are the things that we will negotiate, right? So wages, hours, the contributions to the health trust fund, we do not bargain what the trust fund looks like. That is for the trustees to decide with their work. But we bargain what the premium contributions is that are done by the employer. My understanding is for charter schools, you don't really have to worry about that too much because it's done up here at this level, but that is done here. 
Um, and then other terms and conditions of employment. And so you do need to be aware of, if you are going down the road and you're looking to do major changes, right, or even sometimes minor changes, if you are um, doing something that potentially will affect the employee's work, right? So you're going to um, pick up your school and move it to another location. You're required to consult with us. There's a consultation that has to occur with us. And oftentimes we don't find out until after the fact, after the charter has done something. And then we have to go back and correct it and say, hey, hello, you need to talk to us. So if you are doing something that's affecting bargaining unit employees on your campus in some sort of significant way, you better be having at least a conversation with us, right? Um, especially if it's contract stuff, you're going to have to bargain potentially a supplemental agreement to adjust it. Uh, specific to charter schools, so in the collective bargaining law, which is chapter 89, there are specific provisions related to charter schools, right? And so specific to charter school collective bargaining, you folks have the right um, as a governing board to sit down and negotiate a supplemental agreement with us. Uh, you can do that with HGA, you can do that with UPW. I won't speak to what their policies are, I will just tell you what our policies are internally and how we handle that. They probably handled it as slightly different. So we um, are more than happy to engage in that conversation. I would say about a third of our charter schools have no additional supplemental agreement. About a third might have some little memorandum of an agreement on maybe one topic in the contract. And then we have about a third that have really comprehensive. Ho'okako schools probably have the most comprehensive supplemental because they've been around a while and they've invested a lot of time. Those supplemental agreements do sunset with the contract. And so what will happen in this coming year is that there will need to be discussions as we are actively bargaining the master contract. If you have supplemental agreements or memorandums of understanding that you want to continue beyond 2021, those conversations at your school level will need to occur so that you're prepared once that happens. Okay, and so you have that right. Um, the governing board is the entity that needs to decide who has the authority at the table with us to bargain with us, right? And so that's one of the questions we'll ask. If a director comes to me and says, oh, I wanna do this, we're gonna ask, do you have authority from the governing board? Have you been given authority to, to bargain for the governing board? Because under the law, technically, it's the governing board that is in entering into that agreement with us. We have an internal policy at HSPA that's been around a long time that we will not negate or lessen the, the benefits that are in the master contract, right? So we have the final say on whether we're going to agree to some sort of supplemental. So even if a group of teachers came to us from a charter and says, we want to take a 15% pay cut, we're not going to agree to that. We want to cut our prep time. We're not going to do that. We will not allow that floor-based benefits of wages and working conditions to be diminished because that impacts all the teachers across the state. Because if I give your teachers a 10% pay cut, and yes, fully acknowledging that it is a struggle to be a charter school because of funding and facilities and all of that. Um, if I do that, that opens up the door for the Department of Education to come in and say, oh, well, the teachers at this school take a 10% cut, why don't you take a 10% cut? Um, and so we have a policy that requires that. We also have a policy that is not what the law requires, but is what we internally as an organization requires, that the teachers on your campus have to vote and ratify that supplemental. So if we're engaging in that bargaining, they will have an opportunity to vote on it at some point, right at the end before we do the final sign off. Because under the law, the association does the sign off. So technically, my exec, my president could sign off on that memorandum under understanding. There's no requirement for ratification on anything except for that master agreement, okay? So that's our internal process that we, um, we use, okay? Um, some other things that I know we could have like a long philosophical conversation about is charter school funding. I think we can all agree that it is challenging to navigate and frustrating and there's a lot of inequities. Totally agree. We have been at the legislature advocating on behalf of charter schools for years trying to get things funded like facilities money, like having line item for additional pay um, things like national board certified teachers. Um, but this is what the language says in the law. You should be familiar with it. And I think the biggest thing is, is that if you engage in a supplemental agreement for extra money, and I've had, I've had schools do it, 
We have schools that have salary schedules that are higher than the DOE. We've had schools that pay retention bonuses. We've had schools that have um, restructured their department head duties and given more money. All of that costs extra money. When you do that, what is going to happen is budget and finance is going to tell you that's great, but you've got to take it from some other source. We're not going to give you some magic money. I would love to wave my, my wand and make those systems be a little bit more accommodating for charters, but at this point in time, I know of no magic button to say everything we negotiate that the budget and finance is just going to pay for you guys. And so just be aware that they will, they will zero in on this and say, no, 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 you did this in addition to the master. The master will take care of. But if you do extra stuff, you guys got to find another way to fund it, whether it's from your per pupil or it's from a foundation or a grant or whatever source of funds you have. Okay. Payroll deduction. Okay. So you have an obligation to tell us who are the employees that are in our bargaining unit at your school as quickly as possible. Ideally, from day one when they start, we should have a list being sent to our office. And then we will, once we sign them up, notify you that you need to start doing payroll deduction. We'll tell you the amounts. Ours are pretty simple because it's a standard amount. Our accounting office will work with you folks on that to um, make sure that that gets transmitted. Um, but you do need to make sure that you do that. There, are, there is also a provision in the law that if our association has additional fees, insurance premiums, things like that, and I don't know about the other un uh, bargaining units if they have those, those can be asked to be taken out as well. Um, there was a Supreme Court case a couple years ago that took away mandatory dues. So there used to be what were called statutory dues, where everyone had to pay no matter what. And it was, um, it was called a fee. Those people were called fee payers if they were not members of the union. That has gone away. But if we tell you that they have signed up, you do need to process that payroll. And if you don't, we will have to have some words and follow up with you. <laughs> okay. Um, the other piece is that the law was modified somewhat a couple years ago, but that uh, payment continues until there is um, notification from us that that person has dropped or terminated their membership, and then we'll let you know. Um, there is also language in the law that allows the unions to hold them to an anniversary date of when they sign that membership form. I can't speak for the other unions. I will tell you that for HSTA, operationally what we are doing is as soon as they sign up we start their dues and if they happen to drop which is pretty rare we will terminate as soon as the next available paycheck and we can notify you okay all right so um, I sort of already covered this supplemental agreements we have some schools that have really extensive agreements we have some that just have one or two and then no additional there is no requirement that you have to get a supplemental agreement that is not a requirement to be a charter school it's as you, as you need, okay? Um, salary schedule, I'm gonna show you the salary schedule in just a sec, the current one, and then there will be another pay raise this coming fall, right, we're in March, yep, this fall. Um, and so a couple of things. In order to be a public school teacher in the state of Hawaii, by law, you must be licensed um, or hold some sort of emergency license status from the Hawaii Teacher Standards Board. And to get that, generally, you have to have what's called a state-approved teacher education program. And that plays a role in their salary assignment and where they get. So your education determines a lot of where you're placed on the schedule initially. There are classifications and there are steps on the schedule. Um, initial placement under the contract and under the um, school code is that they can be given up to six years of credit for placement. I will tell you that operationally what most charter schools do is if they're coming from the DOE, they'll ask them to show their Form 5 and they'll keep them at that same um, step placement. And then you should be aware if you're not that we have additional compensation in the contract um, for this current contract called 21 hours. So they're basically paid for 21 hours a year or the equivalent of what is three days, right, that you add hours to the seven hour work day throughout the year. And there's a bunch of rules about it, but it is for professional development. And if they work all of those hours, you do need to pay, or you do need to compensate them in addition to the money that they're getting their salary, they get three PD credits. And so um, I'm sure people have questions about that. I won't go into all the details, but you just need to be aware of, that's an additional about 1.4% on their schedule. 
and it's in the, um, the schedules. It's built into the schedules. You can see it on the schedules. Okay, so this is really small. This is the current schedule. It says it was effective last school year, right? Second quarter of 1819 school year. So this was a pay raise of three and a half percent. This last fall, all the teachers had a step movement. So if you were on step five, you moved to step six, six to seven, etc. So the schedule itself did not change because it was a movement. It's 3% between each step, except for step 14A and 14B is a 6% jump for our most senior teachers. So those people that started this contract around step 14, they got a pretty nice, um, they'll be in a pretty nice place when they end the, the contract. Starting this fall, um, during the second quarter, this is the new schedule. I'm proud to say we've worked really hard. It's taken a long time. But starting teacher salary, if you have a state approved teacher ed program, will be over $50,000 for the first time in the state of Hawaii. Which sounds like a lot of money, but as we all know with the cost of living, we still got a long way to go. Um, this is the 10 month schedule. In the contract, you will see schedules that, are, that will say CC, DD, or EE, in this case is E. E is the 10 month, the double letter is the 12 month. So you may choose to have 12 month employees, and so they have a 20% bump on all of their pay and they work year round and have a whole other thing. This schedule reflects a 3.5% raise. You are obligated to implement this. You do need to make sure your payroll is processing this effective the first day of second quarter of next year. This is the last pay raise of this contract which expires June 30th of 2021. Okay. A um, couple of other things. We have classifications that move this way across the schedule and then these are your steps. These three steps are, are reserved for folks who are what are called instructors. Those are emergency hires. Those are people who do not have a state approved teacher ed program. They do not have the education um, yet. Once they have completed their state approved teacher ed program, they can move up to the main schedule here. So if someone comes to you from UH, they have their teacher ed program, they're licensed, they're going to start at step five typically, right, if they're a brand new teacher. If they have experience, then you're going to have to do some conversations about that and potentially place them higher. The schedules right now are shaded. The white is their base salary. The gray includes the 21 hours. Again, that's about 1.4 so percent. Um, it's the equivalent of three extra days of pay. Okay. Um, reclass or classification, you come in at a bachelor's, BA, so you notice here it says initial classification or at a master's or, or BA plus 30, or you come in at a doctorate. You cannot place people at four, five, or six. That's not initial classification <coughs> placement, okay? Um, once people come in, you are required under state law to have a reclassification system. They, under the contract, can reclassify with 15 PD credits. A lot of schools out there do not have that, and as time goes on, you will start to get members or teachers who will ask, what is the reclassification system? If you choose to use DOE payroll processing in their system, that's the simplest. Fully recognize that you may not like that, but that is um, a real simple way to sort of outsource that process. Many of our schools have come up with their own reclassification systems. You just need to know that you need to have a system. As an employer, you're obligated to have something in place. Okay, um, supplementary pay. You should be aware that there are additional supplementary pays to the main base salary. Um, there is a provision in the back for hard to staff locations. We recently uh, worked with the department and they have announced that they're paying shortage differentials for DOE teachers. I would just give a ba basic spiel on this and if we wanna dive deeper later, we can. Essentially, the superintendent decided she wanted to initiate shortage differentials. She came to us, she consulted with us. We had multiple discussions back and forth, back and forth, and we came to agreement on the differentials that she has um, initiated and for those schools that were affected that are already in the contract the hard to staff and the MOU in the back they were getting three thousand dollars that three thousand dollars was increased for those schools um, in some cases it was kept the same um, on the Big Island and um, some areas it was kept the same but there were some that went up to five and eight thousand dollars so um, these were initiated We've heard a lot of scuttlebutt from charter schools of saying, what about us, what about us? What I'm going to tell you is that in the back and forth of meeting with the superintendent, the Board of Education, the governor, the governor put funding for both DOE 
and charters into his supplemental budget. None of that money has been released. The superintendent has chosen to front the cost for this semester on the hope that the, the, that the legislature is going to fund. So you've probably been seeing things on the news. We've been lobbying down to the legislature. I can go into lots of detail later. But bottom line is there are hard to staff differentials geographically for DOE schools that are being paid right now. There are SPED differentials being paid right now. And there are um, Hawaiian language immersion differentials being paid right now. Those, some of those cross over for charters. In particular, DOE pays for the cost of SPED teachers. DOE is paying, if it is a DOE funded SPED teacher position, classroom position, there's a bunch of different caveats, they will be processing that $10,000 through that person if they are licensed in classroom. If you are a school in a hard to staff area and you have an Article 6 position or a SPED position that the DOE is funding, they should be processing that as well. The biggest hang up is usually that those people are not licensed or they are not classroom in the case of SPED. Um, they are not funding anything else because those are the positions that they process and they fund and we were able to get them to, to be willing to do that. There is nothing to prevent schools from fronting the money as well. The challenge with charters obviously is you guys don't have the kind of cash flow opportunities and the economies of scale to do that. Um, I've heard rumors that there's some schools that have, have started to uh, front the differentials and I'll be following up with those schools. But bottom line is the money is in the budget. We have to get it out of the legislature. And if we don't get it out of the legislature, it's not going to be any money. Um, the superintendent has committed to funding them going forward even if the money doesn't come. Um, that would be pretty hard for charters. So um, there is supplemental pay for department heads or grade level chairs. There is also other things like if you have a school farm or an orchestra or a band, many of our charter schools don't have those dynamics because they're much smaller, but there is supplemental pay in the back if they meet certain criteria. Other types of compensation could be national board certified teacher, okay? Under state law, if you are a national board certified teacher in a public school, you get five grand. You are obligated to pay that. I will fully acknowledge you don't get anything extra from the state budget and finance, but you are obligated to pay that. The answer you will hear from budget and finance is, well, it's spread out in the per pupil. I acknowledge that that is not, that's a raw deal, but you are obligated to pay that $5,000. If you also meet the criteria that the state has established for hard to staff um, and other areas, there's an additional, so if you're a CSI or a TSI school, and if you are, you'll know what that is, um, it's an additional $5,000. We don't have a ton of teachers out there who are national board at the charters, but you do need to understand that you are obligated to pay it. And if the teacher comes to us and says you're not paying it, we will be forced to file a grievance. Um, there are other specific, specific negotiated monies that charters may do. And that's, again, up to whatever supplementals you have. Okay. Um, the last piece, I think this is the last piece, is um, transfers. I always get a lot of questions about transfers. Is there such thing as a transfer process? Can I transfer from DOE to charter, charter to charter, um, charter back to DOE? What happens? Uh, this is really guided by the uh, HRS 302D26, this law has been monkeyed around with many times over the years. This is the current version of it. Uh, and I want to be very clear. There is no such thing as a transfer between charter to charter or a transfer between DOE to charter or vice versa. The law talks about facilitating movement. That is a very fancy way of saying you can resign from one school and apply to the other one and get picked up. Um, it confuses teachers. Uh, it makes people think that they have seamless employment. You guys are separate employers, right? So you have State of Hawaii umbrella, you have DOE, Charter 1, Charter 2, Charter 3, Charter 4, Charter 5, right? Um, and so there is supposed to be a system of facilitating movement. Right? And so part of that is like the DOE, for example, is supposed to be providing position listings to the various charter schools. So we're in assignment and transfer right now. There is a way that teachers can sort of navigate and say, oh, I'm interested in a position. But eventually they will have to resign from your school to go back to the DOE or vice versa, right? Um, they will, if they're interested in a position at your school, they'll have to resign from their school to go to your school. Um, the other big question we get is, 
does my tenure status transfer? I've been in the DOE for 10 years, I'm tenured, and I'm gonna go to HTA. Do I take that tenure with me? The answer is no. Um, that is because the law basically says that you have to first have comparable and verifiable professional development and employee evaluation standards. You guys all do PD different. You guys all do evaluation different. So there's really no way to match match, right? Across DOE it's standardized, right? Um, and then it talks about if you are, um, are you, if you are a charter teacher who is not yet tenured in the, excuse me, wait, I gotta get this straight. Licensed charter teachers as determined by the standards board who are not yet tenured in the department and are entering or returning to the department after employee at a charter. So I, I was at a charter, I'm licensed, I wanna go back to the Department of Education you have to be subject to that probationary period at that school and vice versa and that's the bottom. So bottom line is, if I'm a DOE teacher, it doesn't matter how many years I have in the DOE, if I come to your charter school, I have to do my probation over. The contract dictates that. The contract requires three years of probation or six semesters. Upon return in that seventh semester, you are now tenured, okay? Why is that? I'm gonna be very frank. DOE and charters didn't like having to quote unquote get stuck with employees that they haven't had a chance to evaluate. They don't know their experience, et cetera, et cetera. And there's been a lot of back and forth, but this is the way the law is. My own members don't like this. I, at this point, you know, we tried to stop changes, we tried to get changes, but this is what the law says. Same thing, if they are a charter teacher and they want to go to the DOE, the DOE will make them redo it. The exception is this. If you have someone that was in the Department of Education and they were tenured at the time they left the DOE and they come back to the DOE after resigning, doesn't matter where they go, has nothing to do with the fact that they're going to a charter, they come back to the DOE within five years, the current procedure at the DOE is they will recognize the, where they left on the salary schedule, they will give them back their, pay, their, their sick leave and they will recognize their tenure. But that's because they had tenure status at the time they left the DOE. It has nothing to do with where they went after that, okay? So a couple of just things to be aware of, and it varies from school to school, and whatever HR and payroll systems you have set up, and really quite honestly, the skill set of the people that you have working at your school. Um, you do need to give us timely notification. If you're hiring a teacher, you need to let us know. You can't wait six months. You have a legal obligation to let us know. Um, please make sure that you are transmitting timely um, ERS contributions, i.e., if, if you're a new employee now, you have to pay a portion of your salary to ERS. We have had issues with charter schools who have just not done that. I'll be very frank. We've had issues with charter schools who have taken the money out of teachers' pay paychecks and spent it on other things, which is fraud. You can't do that either. And that screws that teacher up down the road, right? So you need to make sure that that is happening. You need to make sure as well that the EUTF is happening. When they come to you as a new employee, you have to process their EUTF. It doesn't magically transfer from the DOE. They have to go through that process. Again, you need to make sure that they have that notice, you need to make sure that the money you're collecting from them is getting sent to EUTF to pay for their premiums. Those are big things that you've got to, like, you can't screw that up, okay? Once we tell you that, you, that that person has signed a membership card, you've got to transmit those dues to us in a timely fashion, right? Th that has to come to us. Um, so same thing with timely enrollment and processing, making sure that they know they got to sign up for their medical, making sure that you're notifying ERS, all of that. If one thing I can tell you is you need to have consistent practices. You can't treat teacher one differently than you teach teacher two, teach differently than you teach teacher three. That is what you're gonna get into trouble with. We've had issues over the years where people have cut little side deals. That is a no-no, you need to be consistent. You start doing that, you are gonna get to yourself into trouble. You need to have a system for tracking your leave. That is huge. We have had charter schools that like basically didn't do anything for years and then someone has a catastrophic medical emergency and suddenly says, I've got 60, 70, 80 days of leave saved up. And you're saying, no, 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 I know you took sick leave. Where's the documentation? You need to track their leave. If they're a 12-monther, there's vacation and that has 
liability, right? When they leave as a 12 month teacher, they can bank vacation, you gotta pay that out. So you need to track vacation. Teachers have personal leave. There's a whole tracking that you need to be to do, do with that, right? And then reclassification. For our teachers, if you have not set up a reclassification process, at some point you will likely get asked by a teacher and you're gonna need to have an answer to what your process is. Is it they just submit anything and you'll accept any credit? Is it it has to go to some sort of board? Is it you're gonna just follow the DOE process? What is it? You need to figure that out. Okay, and I'm gonna say write your questions down and then I think either my H HGA or my UPW guys, or you. We just pop up. Yes. Like a magic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. On this.